Section four of The Mutiny of the Bounty by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mutiny of the Bounty, abridged from William Bly's narrative, and other narratives by William Bly. Chapter four Fate of the Mutineers Colony of Pitcairn's Island. The intelligence of the mutiny and the sufferings of Bly and his companions naturally excited a great sensation in England. Bly was immediately promoted to the rank of commander, and Captain Edwards was dispatched to Otaheite in the Pandora frigate, with instructions to search for the bounty and her mutinous crew, and bring them to England. The Pandora reached Matavai Bay on the 23rd of March, 1791, and even before she had come to anchor, Joseph Coleman, formerly armorer of the bounty, pushed off from shore in a canoe and came on board. In the course of two days afterwards, the whole of the remainder of the bounty's crew, in number sixteen, then on the island surrendered themselves, with the exception of two who fled to the mountains, where, as it afterwards appeared, they were murdered by the natives. From his prisoners, and the journals kept by one or two of them, Captain Edwards learned the proceedings of Christian and his associates after turning Bly and his companions adrift in the boat. It appears that they steered, in the first instance, to the island of Tuboai, where they intended to form a settlement, but the opposition of the natives, and the want of many necessary materials, determined them to return in the meantime to Otaheite, where they arrived on the 25th of May, 1789. In answer to the inquiries of Tina, the king, about Bly and the rest of the crew, the mutineers stated that they had fallen in with Captain Cook, who was forming a settlement in a neighboring island, and had retained Bly and the others to assist him, while they themselves had been dispatched to Otaheite for an additional supply of hogs, goats, fowls, breadfruit, and various other articles. Overjoyed at hearing their old friend Cook was alive, and about to settle so near them, the humane and unsuspicious islanders set about so actively to procure the supplies wanted, that in a few days the bounty received on board three hundred and twelve hogs, thirty-eight goats, eight dozen of fowls, a bull and a cow, and a large quantity of breadfruit, plantains, bananas, and other fruits. The mutineers also took with them eight men, nine women, and seven boys, with all of whom they arrived a second time at Tuboai on the 26th of June, where they warped the ship up the harbor, landed the livestock, and set about building a fort of fifty yards square. Quarrels and disagreements, however, soon broke out amongst them. The poor natives were treated like slaves, and upon attempting to retaliate, were mercilessly put to death. Christian, finding his authority almost entirely disregarded, called a consultation as to what steps were next to be taken, when it was agreed that Tuboai should be abandoned, that the ship should once more be taken to Otaheite, where those who might choose it would be put ashore, while the rest, who preferred remaining in the vessel, might proceed wherever they had a mind. This was accordingly done. Sixteen of the crew went ashore at Matavai, fourteen of whom, as already stated, were received on board the Pandora, and two were murdered. While Christian, with his eight comrades, and taking with them seven Otaheitan men and twelve women, finally sailed from Matavai on the 21st of September, 1789, from which time they had never been more heard of. Captain Edwards instituted a strict search after the fugitives amongst the various groups of islands in the Pacific, but finding no trace of them, he set sail, after three months' investigation, for the east coast of Australia. Here, by some mismanagement, the Pandora struck upon the singular coral reef that runs along that coast, called the Barrier Reef, and filled so fast that scarcely were the boats got out when she foundered and went down, thirty-four of the crew and four of the prisoners perishing in her. The concurring testimony of the unfortunate prisoners exhibits the conduct of Captain Edwards towards them, both before and after the wreck, as having been cruel in the extreme. After reaching a low, sandy, desert island, or rather key, as such are nautically termed, 
Captain Edwards caused his men to form tents out of the sails they had saved, under which he and his men reposed in comparative comfort. But he refused the same indulgence to his miserable captives, whose only refuge, therefore, from the scorching rays of the sun, was by burying themselves up to the neck amongst the burning sand, so that their bodies were blistered as if they had been scalded with boiling water. The Pandora's survivors reached Batavia in their boats, whence they obtained passages to England in Dutch vessels. A court-martial was soon afterwards held, September 1792, when six of the ten mutineers were found guilty and condemned to death. The other four were acquitted. Only three of the six, however, were executed. Nearly twenty years elapsed after the period of the above occurrences, and all the recollection of the bounty and her wretched crew had passed away, when an accidental discovery, as interesting as unexpected, once more recalled public attention to that event. The captain of an American schooner, having in 1808 accidentally touched at an island up to that time supposed to be uninhabited, called Pitcairn's Island, found a community speaking English, who represented themselves as the descendants of the mutineers of the bounty, of whom there was still one man, of the name of Alexander Smith, alive amongst them. Intelligence of this singular circumstance was sent by the American captain, Folger, to Sir Sidney Smith of Valparaiso, and by him transmitted to the Lords of the Admiralty. But the government was at that time perhaps too much engaged in the events of the Continental War to attend to the information, nor was anything further heard of this interesting little society until 1814. In that year, two British men-of-war, cruising in the Pacific, made Pitcairn's Island, and on nearing the shore saw plantations regularly and orderly laid out. Soon afterwards they observed a few natives coming down a steep descent with their canoes on their shoulders, and in a few minutes perceived one of these little vessels darting through a heavy surf and paddling off towards the ships. But their astonishment may be imagined when, on coming alongside, they were hailed in good English with, "'Won't you heave us a rope now?' This being done, a young man sprang up the side with extraordinary activity, and stood on the deck before them. In answer to the question, "'Who are you?' he replied that his name was Thursday October Christian, son of the late Fletcher Christian, by an Otahetan mother, that he was the firstborn on the island, and was so named because he was born on a Thursday in October. All this sounded singular and incredible in the ears of the British captains, Sir Thomas Staines and Mr. Pippin, but they were soon satisfied of its truth. Young Christian was at this time about twenty-four years old, a tall, handsome youth, fully six feet high, with black hair and an open, interesting English countenance. As he wore no clothes except a piece of cloth round his loins, and a straw hat ornamented with black cock's feathers, his fine figure and well-shaped muscular limbs were displayed to great advantage, and attracted general admiration. His body was much tanned by exposure to the weather, but although his complexion was somewhat brown, it wanted that tinge of red peculiar to the natives of the Pacific. He spoke English correctly, both in grammar and pronunciation and his frank and ingenuous deportment excited in every one the liveliest feelings of compassion and interest. His companion was a fine, handsome youth of seventeen or eighteen years of age, named George Young, son of one of the Bounty's midshipmen. The youths expressed great surprise at everything they saw, especially a cow, which they had supposed to be either a huge goat or a horned sow, having never seen any other quadrupeds. When questioned concerning the bounty, they referred the captains to an old man on shore, the only surviving Englishman, whose name, they said, was John Adams, but who proved to be the identical Alexander Smith before mentioned, having changed his name from some caprice or other. The officers went ashore with the youths, and were received by old Adams, as we shall now call him, who conducted them to his house, and treated them to an elegant repast of eggs, fowl, yams, plantains, breadfruit, etc. They now learned from him an account of the fate of his companions, 
who with himself preferred accompanying Christian in the bounty to remaining at Otaheite, which account agreed with that he afterwards gave at greater length to Captain Beechey in 1825. Our limits will not permit us to detail all the interesting particulars at length, as we could have wished, but they are in substance as follows. It was Christian's object, in order to avoid the vengeance of the British law, to proceed to some unknown and uninhabited island, and the Marquesas Islands were first fixed upon. But Christian, on reading Captain Carteret's account of Pitcairn Island, thought it better adapted for the purpose and shaped his course thither. Having landed and traversed it, they found it every way suitable to their wishes, possessing water, wood, a good soil, and some fruits. Having ascertained all this, they returned on board, and having landed their hogs, goats, and poultry, and gutted the ship of everything that could be useful to them, they set fire to her, and destroyed every vestige that might lead to the discovery of their retreat. This was on the 23rd of January, 1790. The island was then divided into nine equal portions amongst them, a suitable spot of neutral ground being reserved for a village. The poor Otahetans now found themselves reduced to the condition of mere slaves, but they patiently submitted, and everything went on peaceably for two years. About that time Williams, one of the seamen, having the misfortune to lose his wife, forcibly took the wife of one of the Otahetans, which, together with their continued ill-usage, so exasperated the latter that they formed a plan for murdering the whole of their oppressors. The plot, however, was discovered and revealed by the Englishmen's wives, and two of the Hotahetans were put to death. But the surviving natives soon afterwards matured a more successful conspiracy, and in one day murdered five of the Englishmen, including Christian. Adams and Young were spared at the intercession of their wives, and the remaining two, McCoy and Quintal, escaped to the mountains, whence, however, they soon rejoined their companions. But the further career of these two villains was short. McCoy, having been bred up in a Scottish distillery, succeeded in extracting a bottle of ardent spirits from the root, from which time he and Quintal were never sober, until the former became delirious and committed suicide by jumping over a cliff. Quintal, being likewise almost insane with drinking, made repeated attempts to murder Adams and Young, until they were absolutely compelled, for their own safety, to put him to death. Adams and Young were at length the only surviving males who had landed on the island, and being both of a serious turn of mind, and having time for reflection and repentance, they became extremely devout. Having saved a Bible and a prayer-book from the bounty, they now performed family worship morning and evening, and addressed themselves to training up their own children and those of their unfortunate companions in piety and virtue. Young, however, was soon carried off by an asthmatic complaint, and Adams was thus left to continue his pious labors alone. At the time Captains Staines and Pippin visited the island, this interesting little colony consisted of about forty-six persons, mostly grown-up young people, all living in harmony and happiness together, and not only professing, but fully understanding and practicing the precepts and principles of the Christian religion, while Adams had instituted the ceremony of marriage. The visitors, having supplied these interesting people with some tools, kettles, and other articles, took their leave. The account which they transmitted home of this newly discovered colony was, strange to say, as little attended to by government as that of Captain Folger, and nothing more was heard of Adams and his family for nearly twelve years, when in 1825 Captain Beechey in the Blossom, bound on a voyage of discovery to Bering Strait, touched at Pitcairn's Island. On the approach of the Blossom a boat came off under all sail towards the ship, containing old Adams and ten of the young men of the island. After requesting and obtaining leave to come on board, the young men sprang up the side and shook every officer cordially by the hand. Adams, who was grown very corpulent, followed more leisurely. He was dressed in a sailor's shirt and trousers, with a low-crowned hat, which he held in his hand in sailor fashion, while he smoothed down his bald forehead when addressed by the officers of the Blossom. 
the little colony had now increased to about sixty-six, including an English sailor of the name of John Buffett, who, at his own earnest desire, had been left by a whaler. In this man the society luckily found an able and willing schoolmaster. He instructed the children in reading, writing, and arithmetic, and devoutly cooperated with old Adams in affording religious instruction to the community. The officers of the Blossom went ashore, and were entertained with a sumptuous repast at young Christians, the table being spread with plates, knives, and forks. Buffett said grace in an emphatic manner, and so strict were they in this respect that it was not deemed proper to touch a morsel of bread without saying grace both before and after it. The officers slept in the house all night, their bedclothing and sheets consisting of the native cloth made of the native mulberry tree. The only interruption to their repose was the melody of the evening hymn, which was chanted together by the whole family after the lights were put out, and they were awakened at early dawn by the same devotional ceremony. On Sabbath the utmost decorum was attended to, and the day was passed in regular religious observances. In consequence of a representation made by Captain Beechey, the British government sent out Captain Waldegrave in 1830 in the Serengapatam, with a supply of sailors' blue jackets and trousers, flannels, stockings and shoes, women's dresses, spades, mattocks, shovels, pickaxes, trowels, rakes, etc. He found their community increased to about seventy-nine, all exhibiting the same unsophisticated and amiable characteristics as we have before described. Other two English gentlemen had settled amongst them, one of them, Nobbs, a missionary. The patriarch Adams, it was found, had died in March 1829, aged sixty-five. While on his deathbed, he had called the heads of families together and urged upon them to elect a chief. Captain Waldegrave thought that the island, which is about four miles square, might be able to support a thousand persons, upon reaching which number they would naturally emigrate to other islands. In 1856 the British government thought it advisable to deport the whole of the inhabitants to the number of 194 to Norfolk Island, about 900 miles east-northeast of Sydney. This island had long been used as a convict prison, but the establishment had that year been broken up. The colonists were provided in their new quarters with houses, domestic animals, implements, seeds, boats, etc., in the end of the following year they were visited by the governor of New South Wales, who organized a magistracy among them, and established a code of laws. They had increased to two hundred and twelve. He found it necessary to introduce a few skilled workmen from England to teach them certain indispensable trades, and also a schoolmaster. On his second visit, in 1859, the governor found that two families, numbering sixteen persons, had returned to Pitcairn's Island, and that others were thinking of following the example. This tendency he succeeded in checking. In 1862 the community had increased to 280 persons, and European usages were slowly spreading. Subsequent reports represent a steady advance in numbers and prosperity. End of Chapter 4 Fate of the Mutineers, Colony of Pitcairn's Island Read by John Greenman